Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are here yet again with another episode for you today, and I'm and I'm with my new friend, relatively new friend, Charity Maurer. Charity, thank you so much for making time for the Boca Podcast listeners today. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so honored to be here. Our focus, our topic of the day today has to do with elevating your photography business's brand to the luxury level. And this is a pretty loaded topic, but I'm, I'm curious to get your spin on it. We'll go there here in just a few minutes. But to start off with, as we normally do at the Boca Podcast, we're going to talk about something called our, a technique for time or a tool for time. And I'm curious to get your perspective, I guess, on how to create space for yourself or time for yourself as a photography business owner. Is there a particular thing that you do in order to create that space for yourself? Well, first, I want to say that that's such a good question. I think it's really hard to be an entrepreneur and to have to find time for yourself because it's such an an involved career path for sure. So love the question. I would say the way that I have found best to find free time and, and time for myself is to create rhythms and routines around rest for myself. So even if it's as simple as I go to the gym every Monday at this time, just creating a rhythm and then honoring that rhythm every week has been really effective for me. And do you think it's, is it the repetition that uh, enables you to be more consistent in that? What is the significance of the rhythm? I think the rhythm just helps you allot your time to build that in prior. So you're reserving that space and time and you're not saying I'm going to do this if there's time, but I'm going to do this. And so you've created space for that. Yeah, I think there's there's something innately proactive to that mentality, and I really like that. It, it, we've talked about this on the podcast before. I, I don't personally, as somebody who tends to be structured and organized and uh, utilize a schedule, I don't simultaneously want to micromanage my time, right? I don't want to be breaking my my day-to-day schedule down into 15-minute increments and and feel like I have to do this do this thing at this point and and then and then you know the next 15 minutes is up and now I got to go do this and I'm constantly on the go and I'm constantly rushed and I'm thinking about the next thing coming up. That just to me it doesn't equate to the freedom, the flexibility that I want to have as a photography business owner or as an entrepreneur. But I think a little bit of structure is a great thing. And so having a loose structure for your day, a loose structure for your week, and then repeating that process over and over again, you're right. I don't think we've used the word rhythm on the podcast any before. So I'm glad that you bring this Mm. up. It really does create a wonderful rhythm. And there's something to consistency that is comfortable, but it also makes it a lot easier to repeat or to just ultimately to be consistent. And I think that's really important. So I, I like this. It, proactivity, which leads to a little bit of structure, which can equate to a rhythm that's comfortable and, and encourages consistency. I think that's a beautiful thing. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And speaking of free time, how do you like to spend the, the free time that you're able to create for yourself? I love to read books. So it's funny because I actually love to read business books, which I know is like related to my job. So it's hard to um, see that as rest, but sometimes it really feels that way to me. So I definitely love reading books. I love to exercise. So my husband actually used to be a professional personal trainer. That's what he did for his career. So he's really gifted me with that love for exercise. So that's a huge part of my life. And also, because I have two kids, <laughs> I love, love uh, date nights. Oh, yeah. You've got to have that, that little bit of time away for sure. But it, it's funny. I have, to, I have to ask you, your husband being a personal trainer, a former personal trainer, do, do, you, do you go to him for tips and ideas for your exercise regimen? What does that look like? Hmm, that's a good question. So he definitely is the one who taught me how to exercise properly and has given me a foundation. But since just having received that from him, I I do a pretty good job just on my own figuring that out. I mean, 
interestingly enough, I think it's kind of like photography. When you have those basics down, you can, you can really translate that and make it your own, you know? Absolutely. No, I think that's a really great point. I spent quite a number of years actually developing an understanding of the, of, of healthy principles behind exercise and diet. And people use the word diet a lot to, to mean some particular eating style that lasts for you know a short period of time. When I think about diet, I think about an eating style or an approach to eating. Uh, but I spent quite a bit of time studying these principles. And now what that enables me is the very thing that you just described, some flexibility and again, some freedom to be able to create a routine or a set of routines that work really well for me. And it does actually, to your earlier point, encourage a certain rhythm, uh, which enables consistency. And I think that's a really, really great thing. You mentioned books too. Is there a particular book that you've read recently that you'd recommend to our listeners? Mm, so many. But because we were just talking about it before the we hit record, Story Brand was one of my favorite books that I read this year. Definitely flew through that one. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and then also I just love Seth Godin. Do you, do you know that name? Absolutely. He he have I've read a number yeah. of his books and I've followed his blog over the years. He has a certain way of communicating ideas. Uh, I, I keep using this word succinctly, but it, there, there's something to be said these days for being able to communicate an idea in a relatively short amount of time, but in an, in an impactful way. Uh, it's something that I work mm. at on an ongoing basis in my personal life and even hosting this podcast. I have a tendency of getting a little bit too wordy. Seth has a way of kind of cutting out all the unnecessary stuff and focusing on the, the idea <laughs> and then being able to communicate it effectively. And it's really powerful stuff. So we'll make sure to link to at least to his blog and maybe at a couple of his books in the show notes as well. And then to your earlier point, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. We'll also link to that in the show notes. It is an extremely powerful, powerful book for those photographers who are, whether they're they're just starting off in photography and wanting to build a business or have been in business for a little while, but maybe need a little bit of clarity for the sake of their business and for their brand. Uh, it's extremely, extremely powerful. We'll make sure to link to that in the show notes as well. What's something kind of random that most people don't know about you? So I actually used to be a championship level Irish dancer which is um, essentially river dance is, is more common of a term that people know and recognize. But yeah. Irish dance is Irish dance, or sorry, river dance is Irish dancing. Yeah. And that was actually my, my like first big dream goal was to, to dance on river dance, which I never got to do. But yeah, something interesting. I, it really is totally, I'm, I'm kind of smiling and maybe mouth kind of gaped open a little bit here as you responded to that, because that is one of the more random facts that we've heard from our guests on the podcast. I love it. How did you even get into it in the first place? Oh man, I think, I think my dad found it on like PBS channel eight and, and he knew that I loved dance. And so he pulled me over to watch it. And I just remember that moment when I saw it and thinking, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so how many years did you dance for? I danced for 10 years. Wow. Okay. And is it something that you still like to do from time to time just to, just for fun? Yeah. Every once in a while I will, uh, bust down my shoes and, and have fun <laughs> with it. But... <laughs> and is that something that your husband does as well? Or does he get to just observe? No, he actually used to do break dance. Wow. Okay. So that would be an interesting combination, mixing break dancing and Irish dancing. Have you guys figured out a way to combine the two? Okay. So since you asked, there is a YouTube video yeah. that has us doing both and it's actually from our wedding. So that's what we did at our wedding is we performed and he did a, a break dance and I did an Irish dance with uh, my group of girls and it was pretty cool. It's, it's on YouTube. I think if you search like Charity and Andy wedding dance, it'll yeah. come up. Oh, I'm so doing that as soon as we get done with this conversation <laughs> and we're going to make sure to link to it in the show notes for all of our listeners too. So that is oh, absolutely brilliant. That's I love it. That's so funny. I definitely did not plan on sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful random fact of the day. Talk to us a little bit about your photography business and maybe first of all, how you got started and, and how long you've been in photography now. Yeah. So this is actually a really great transition because eight years ago, so 2010, I was engaged and getting married to my husband, Andy. And I was still avidly dancing competitively. 
And I just knew at that point that I was ready to enter this marriage and um, going on tour with Riverdance wasn't something that really fit into fit into the vision anymore. Sure. And just just knowing that I I really loved art and I really loved to create that um, I needed something now to fill that space in my life if I was going to let my dance career go. So I had always just loved the camera and I loved what you could do with the camera. I thought it was incredible. And, and so I thought, well, Hey, I'll pick this up and this will be my new art and this is what I'll do. That's kind of how I started. So did you have, I mean, you were looking for an artistic outlet, but had you had any previous experience with a camera or did you just kind of randomly one day go and and buy one and start shooting? Um, Back to my dad again, he loved cameras. So he would, he would, (laughs) buy like the Nikon the kit at Costco every few years. And I just remember like sneaking and, and grabbing that camera and walking all around my home and photographing flowers and, you know, whatever I could find. And I just thought it was so incredible that you could take just really like simple, mundane day-to-day objects and you could create amazing photos from really simple things. That's really what drew me in. And so this was, you said this was, it all started to happen about 10 years ago. How long have you actually been in business now as a, as a wedding photographer? Eight years. Oh, eight years total. So you just jumped right in then. Yeah, I did. I mean, it was definitely a slow start. So like those first three years, I probably had, you know, just a few clients every couple months or so. It just really, you know, took time for me to figure out a style and to figure out exactly what I was doing. I'd never had a business. I was also 20 years old. (laughs) (laughs) So really, 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 really young. Yeah. Um, so those first three years were truly just experimenting for sure. Oh, I totally get that. And and I, I can relate. I actually started, uh, I think my first wedding I photographed when I was 21, maybe 22 at the latest. And it, you don't, it, it's interesting to think about being a photographer that young. I mean, your perspective on life is different uh, to say the mm-hmm. least. And so how that affects your photography could be an interesting study in and of itself. But I, mm-hmm. I, I love that you just kind of went for it. And did you start in film or did you start digital? No. So I started digital. So kind of, kind of backing up. So let me like create a timeline here out of what I've said. Yeah. So when I had picked up my dad's camera and just started experimenting and shooting, that was like 15, 16 years old. So all of this like fascination with the camera started during those years when my my um, dance career was happening. So then when it ended is when I knew like I'm going to pick up this thing and really go for it. So at that time, I did uh, start to take photo classes just at community college. And I would have started with with film, interestingly enough. And I just remember thinking, this is so stupid <laughs> why am I learning <laughs> why am I learning film it's so outdated yeah. like I I know what I want to do and and I know that digital is a part of that plan but it was a really cool class for sure it was black and white so I took that and then I also took um, some more digital classes I actually was set up to transfer to ASU local uh, university for photojournalism and I thought that was the path that I was headed on but after the two years at community college, I had realized that's a really different world than photographing weddings and portraits. And I just knew at that time that that wasn't the path that I should take. But interestingly enough, then you were able to take your experience in film photography and, and apply that later on, right? Because you're, you're extremely passionate about film photography now. Yes. Yeah. So that's the funny thing about it. So yeah. So then from like 2010 to 2014, I shot digital. And then in 2014, I had some friends here who I had seen their switch over to film and I was just fascinated by it. I absolutely loved what I was seeing. And I just felt like my style with, with digital photos would translate so well with the film medium. And I picked up a 35 millimeter Nikon camera, the F100. Oh, I love that camera. Shot my, yeah, it's so great. I still shoot it. Shot my first roll of film when I was on vacation, a family vacation on the beach. And I remember I got those scans back and I was flipping through them and I was sitting next to Andy, my husband in the car. And I, I just was elated and I'm like, honey, 
this is like a game changer. This is what I need to do. Just seeing those photos and seeing how my style translated on that medium was just really, really cool. So what percentage of your photography at this point for your clients is film and what percentage is digital? That's a good question. So all of my portrait sessions are film. I shoot those 100% film. So engagement sessions, if I happen to have a portrait client, all of that is film. On a wedding day, it's probably about 50% just because reception coverage can end up being, you know, a quarter to half of the entire wedding coverage. Right. So right. I do shoot. Yeah. I shoot digital at that time. So yeah. Okay. And, and this is, I don't know, maybe almost an obvious question, but I mean, how do you figure for the cost of the development of all of that film? Because that, as a, as a wedding photographer or portrait photographer for that matter, of course, one of the luxuries of shooting digitally is that you don't have to worry about processing costs. Now you're shooting film and I'm, are you shooting just 35 or are you also shooting medium format? No, I'm shooting medium format the majority of the time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So now you've got this this extremely expensive processing cost to figure in. Are you just building that into the cost of the services that you're offering or how does that work for you? Yeah, that's a, another really interesting kind of transition question because that was actually a huge push to why I wanted to break into the luxury market was because I knew I knew that I was adding that cost and I knew that I was going to have to pay for be able to pay for it. And so I um, inevitably knew I have to raise my prices and I need to attract the client who's going to pay those prices. Interesting. Okay. So would you say that that had to do with maybe one of the toughest lessons that you learned or was there, what, what's, what is one of the toughest lessons that you've learned as a business owner so far? Mm, I actually wouldn't say that it, that it's that, but I love that question because business is really hard <laughs> It's so much fun and it's also really, really hard. So I think, I think one of the lessons that I have learned is that you never reach a point where you can just coast and go. Like you've never arrived. Yeah. You always, always have to keep pushing, keep evolving, keep, keep growing. Although do you, do you just kind of crave a break sometimes? Because I don't know about you, but like, especially lately in the last, I say lately in the last couple of months or so, I've been pushing particularly hard and I've got multiple projects going and I just get to a point where I burn out at, you know, at the end of the week or even maybe midway through the week, where I'm putting extra hours in and I'm thinking really, really hard and I, I get tired. Um, and, and I, I want to have quote arrived, whether it's, you know, just a step in the process of the development of a project or maybe the end of a project or whatever it might be. But I just, sometimes I'm just like, man, I need a break. Do, do you ever feel like that? Absolutely. And I think what's really important is that you honor that part of yourself that, that feels that need. And I certainly recently, actually this spring, I was in the middle of a rebrand. I was just had so much, even in my personal life going on. And, um, and I actually took an entire week off of work and I just carved out that space for myself. Yeah. And that was a really, really beautiful thing for me to do. And then when I came back, it was, it was awesome. I had fresh vision and it was good. Uh, that's a great reminder that, that we do need to create that space for ourselves. But w when you, when you talk about the, the importance of remembering that we haven't we haven't arrived or we never just simply arrived that it's an ongoing process. What does that look like for your business? Hmm. Well, what has been the most interesting to me is that I find that I have kind of this, this rhythm of seasons in my business yeah. where to, to kind of just start is I have an idea and I'm so excited and I work towards that and I build it. And then I get to this place of just amazing success and I'm reaping the reward of all of that hard work. But then it's been so interesting because following that year, that year of just um, re reaping that harvest is often has become my, my lowest year right after that point, which is so interesting. Hmm. And in those times I found I usually have to rework something. I have to come up with something new, change something. Um, so it's just really an interesting cycle. But I guess just ultimately being okay with the fact that it, it may never end, that there's never an end point and enjoying the process. Is, is that a lot of it? It's just kind of an adjustment in mentality. 
I don't know. I, I think enjoying the process is, is a beautiful thing to learn to be able to do for sure. But I just think like, honestly, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to be a business owner and it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. And, and I think you get the highest highs because you're so invested and, and you get to share your gifts in such a vulnerable way. But then I also think you have the lowest lows because it is so vulnerable to, to do your own thing. And when that feels rejected, it's really, really hard. It's true. What? And I think, I mean, of course, this is a multifaceted conversation. Ultimately, there's no real one solution to, to address the reality, of which is that, that, you know, running a business is kind of a never ending process. I, I am reminded of somebody that I talk about quite a bit here on the podcast, just because I find a lot of inspiration in him, but a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, who is, is, a, is becoming more and more kind of a almost like a pop culture icon in the business world. But one of the things he talks about over and over and over again is the significance of learning to enjoy the process, understanding that it's it's never quite done, I guess, as part of that. But ultimately, mm. having a big enough goal in mind that you're wanting to work toward and, and understanding what that goal is, I think is innate to that. And and then just being okay with, with the process of getting there is, is really, really important. How that how we break that down, what that rhythm, I mean, to use the word from earlier, what that rhythm looks like is going to be different from person to person. But I think learning to be okay with that process is really important. I'm, I'm trying to learn personally in my, particularly in my business life, but I guess maybe it carries over to my personal life as well to learn to be okay with that process because I tend to get a little bit impatient. I'm excited about that initial, you, you alluded to it, Charity, the, the kind of the launching <laughs> of a project, right? We, we get to create this new yeah. thing and we're so excited about getting it launched. But then we have to actually make that sustainable. And especially when it comes to creating yes. a new business. I love starting a new business. I come up with an idea and get to, to come up with the, the branding and the, the positioning and the marketing and the new website and, and all of these things. But then once we get it going, we have to actually run it. And we need to actually learn to be either okay with that process and enjoy that process or maybe surround ourselves with a really great team that can help carry out that process. But it is a process. And, and that is a great reminder. I want to go back to film, though. You talked about film, film photography. You mentioned the, the F100, which uh, is actually the camera that I got my wedding photography career, I guess, semi-launched on. I, I started with a really inexpensive Minolta camera. And mm. I, I got really excited to buy this Nikon F100 because it was like I would I would make the correlation between that and, and like riding a scooter and then buying a sports bike. You know, the difference in performance is just vast. Mm. And so I went from this this cheap film SLR to the, the Nikon F100 where it was so responsive, so quick, so much fun to shoot with. Do you have a particular favorite piece of gear in your, in your bag, particularly when it comes to film photography? I love my Pentax. I have a Pentax N2. I love it. I love that it's different because the majority of the competition in my market shoots at the Contax 645. Yeah, yeah. And so I just think it's it's really fun for me to have something else and to figure out how to make it my own. I feel like um, in our industry, it's so like, well, what are other people shooting? What are other people doing? I want my work to look like theirs, you know, and, and I actually don't know a lot of, a lot of film photographers in my level who use a Pentax. So I think that's really fun. And I, I really, really love that camera. Is that, is it because film is not as prevalent? I know it's picked up in popularity as of late, but because it's not as prevalent, is it, is it cheaper now to be able to go purchase a medium format body? Yeah. So that's the other thing I, I really love about the Pentax is I think I got my entire kit for like $1,500 off of eBay. Wow. Yeah. And the, the Contax is like between three and, and 4,000 wow. right now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah. bet those prices came up again with the popularity. I, I will go ahead and give out a, a little plug for a company that I've used over the years for used gear. And I'm sure you could find plenty of medium format gear there too, but K-E-H. So it's just the letters K-E-H dot com. And they're a company that uh, is based out of Atlanta. I was really impressed. I used them over the years as a, as a wedding photographer. They've got a really strict rating system. And what I found is that I'd order gear and, and, and know that it was a, you know, like new minus or excellent plus or whatever it might have been. And I tended to get the gear and it was in even better condition than they even said it was. So I, I was really impressed with that. 
and uh, you can get some really great gear for for good prices through keh.com. I'm in no way associated with them. I just had such a great experience with them. So for those listening in, we'll make sure to link to them in the show notes as well. You can also check out that uh, that company as a resource. Besides eBay, do you have a particular company that you go to to buy your film camera gear from, or do you, do you just go to B&H, or where do you get it from? I think I bought my Nikon F100 on Amazon, and then I bought the Pentax on eBay. So those are really the only experiences that I've had, but I know that people are selling cameras all the time in the the Contact 645 and Pentax 645 Facebook groups. Oh, interesting. And that's a... Yeah, so that's a really great resource if you if you want gears to check out those those forums for sure, and all of those people for sure know really awesome awesome people to buy from. Perfect, but let's let's kind of move on here. I'm curious to hear a little bit about your photography business's brand position, and I want to tie this into our conversation today about luxury or taking our brand to the luxury level. But how would you characterize your photography business's brand position? Yeah, so I photograph high-end clients planning luxury destination weddings in Arizona. So that was a little bit of a mouthful, but essentially I am photographing um, for clients who are planning full destination weddings to my local market. So 90% of my clients actually live out of state and are coming to Arizona to have their wedding. And I have to give you props here because, in fact, you you defined your brand position even more clearly than than when we were having our conversation before we started recording. <laughs> I, I like the specificity of this, and this is one of the important keys to the idea of a brand position to begin with: is specificity. Um, it, it's easy when you say, "Okay, what well, what makes your photography business different?" If I were to ask, you know, any and every photographer in our in our industry or those listening in. What sets your business apart? Unfortunately, there's a tendency with photographers to answer with a very general, you know, I I focus on relationships or I'm a wedding photographer or I'm a portrait photographer or I offer a photojournalistic style of wedding. Well, these are all things that other photographers could say the exact same thing about. And so they really aren't differentiating factors. The way that one of the ways anyway that we can set ourselves apart is to have a very specific or to offer a very specific service. So you start with luxury. There are plenty of photographers that, uh, I say plenty, I mean, percentage-wise, it's relatively small, but there are other photographers that offer high-end wedding photography. But then you get even more specific. You take it take it down another notch and you say, I'm a destination. You're a luxury wedding photographer offering destination services or photography to those that are coming to the Arizonian market. So you've gotten much more specific in that. And that is such an important element of developing an mm-hmm. effective photography business's brand position or photography business brand position. How do you communicate that to your potential clients or how do you work that into your marketing? Uh, Yeah, so that's really interesting. I feel like I have to start with where my clients come from, actually, because what's happening for me is that my clients are actually being educated up front about me from my referral source. So the majority of my clients are coming from wedding planners because these clients are coming to have a destination wedding here outside of their state. That's like a priority for them is hiring a wedding planner. So I have, I have relationships with these planners and these planners are talking to the client saying, what kind of style are you looking for? Mm. And if, and if it fits, seems to fit with my style of film photography, um, then they will send them my name. And so I think just, just automatically, like I'm, I'm validated by these planners who are giving me this referral, who they already trust. And so I think my job then is just to have my storefront just confirm like my status and my level of someone who is a trusted individual who they can, they can trust as someone who's planning a destination wedding and then seeing my work and also seeing my price point and having those things affirm that this is a, is a luxury vendor. This is a luxury wedding photographer that I want to work with. Okay, that's really interesting. So would you say the majority of your business is coming from those wedding planners? Or how does it break down between the business that you get from wedding planners versus, you know, Facebook, or uh, maybe just Google searches? What does that look like? 90%. 
Wow, that's huge. Okay, but do you yeah. think that that yeah. is the case? I mean, when we're talking about truly luxury weddings, that most of the luxury clients are going based on referrals based uh, versus just doing a, a simple search? I do really believe that. Yeah. I think that the luxury client who's planning a destination wedding is first looking at location. They're looking at a venue that they're they're going to plan their wedding at. And then I think from there, if it's truly a luxurious venue, they're often going to require that you have a planner. So then that's number two. Mm. And then the planner is then the one who's going to direct the hiring of these other vendors. So I do think that for, for luxury weddings, I, I do believe that's that's the case the majority of the time. That's really interesting. And, and hopefully that was a bit of an aha moment for a lot of our listeners too, that are interested in getting into this realm of luxury wedding photography. I will say that in my experience as a wedding photographer, going from shooting my first wedding, I think for about $350 to shooting weddings for upwards of $10,000, my best experience uh, when it came to marketing and getting new clients was through a relationship with a local wedding coordinator in the Chattanooga market. Uh, and and the, one of the cool things about that too, and this is something that I believe I've mentioned before in the podcast, but Taylor was this wedding coordinator. Taylor knew whatever price point we were selling our services for at that particular time. And so she could refer the appropriate clients to us. If we built our business on referrals from previous clients, we'd be in a little bit of a trouble, a little bit of trouble because they're likely going to refer clients who are in a comparable income bracket. And if we've since up our prices by two grand or whatever it might've been, um, there's a possibility that those clients may not be able to afford us working with a coordinator they know whatever price point we're selling our services at, they can refer the appropriate client to us. And that makes a really big difference. But this is an interesting point. The other thing that comes to mind too, is we're talking about this, when we're talking about the significance of relationships and particularly for wedding photographers, relationships with wedding coordinators. Uh, I'll just add this as a bit of a side note, but many of those listening in probably know that I own a company called Photographers Edit. We offer editing services to professional photographers. And besides figuring out that you can ultimately save money by outsourcing your editing and not having to do that work yourself, especially when you're aware of how much your time is worth per hour, one of the biggest benefits to having more time, not having to sit in front of the computer, is that you now have time to do things that will actually grow your business. And one of those things that I encourage photographers to do is to develop, with this new time, this newfound time, develop relationships with wedding coordinators. Because... You may spend a couple hundred dollars to outsource the editing of a wedding, but now you have the opportunity to spend those hours developing relationships with a wedding coordinator, wedding coordinators uh, in your market that could translate to th literally thousands of dollars of business as a result. So now not only are you saving time, but you're also making money simultaneously, and it's a pretty brilliant win-win situation. So I just want to throw that in there. Yeah, that's really good. Well, and what would you say... I don't know when we're talking about the idea of luxury. I mean, if we're, if we're looking just at the, the statistics, I know in 2017, about 70, I think about 70% of weddings, 70, 75% of weddings photographed in the US were photographed for $2,000 and less. And then the next 15% or so photographed between two and four grand. And then the top 5% or so that, that are above that four grand range. I know that your price point runs in the five to 10,000 range as well. So just from a, a, a statistics standpoint, the actual price point that we're selling the services at, you certainly fall into the luxury level. But let's get a little bit more specific, a little bit more tangible, because it's one thing to charge a lot of money. But what would you say are the three primary elements of a luxurious experience? How do you create that for your clients? First, I just want to say how much I love this question, because I think that there is a facade that to be a luxury photographer, you have to have a certain level of product that is better than what's below it. And I actually think really interestingly that there is not necessarily, it's not necessarily true that a $5,000 photographer creates better images than a $2,500 photographer. That might be true, but it's not necessarily true. Right. And I think that, I think that what allows a business to charge more for their service actually has to do with the brand and it has to do with an elevated service. Hmm. So 
as far as elements that actually um, really make up a luxurious experience, I would say three of them would be one, offering an elevated service, two, attention to detail, and then three, a more curated product. Not necessarily a better one, but a curated one. Okay, so break break each of those elements down a little bit for us, and let's make it really practical for our listeners. What is that? What do each of those three elements look like in your business? To start with the, the elevated service, how do you offer an elevated service to your clients or potential clients? Yeah, so really, really simple ways. So responsiveness, responding to emails quickly is huge. I think ultimately anything that you can do to make your client's life easier is what you should do. Yeah. And also another like really specific thing that I do is that I have myself, the lead shooter, a second shooter, but then I also actually bring on a third person on the wedding day. And that person is there. It's strategic because they're there to help load my film, which I probably need anyway. I probably need a third person to do that. But I actually sell it to my client that, I have this third person who's a part of my team. They're not shooting, but they are simply there to help make your experience better. They're there to straighten your train. They're there to grab water if you need it. Um, they're just an extra set of hands. Wow. That's interesting. Okay. So now I don't know that we've had any guests on the, the podcast that have, I mean, they may talk about second shooters, as you said, but having a third person there largely to focus on the details can I ask what you average, like on average, what you might pay somebody to, to come along and do that for? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that an average price that people pay for that service is about 150. I pay a little bit more. I pay about 185 or so for mine, but that's because she is actually an assistant for me. She does a little bit more than just the wedding day hands-on service. And she actually helps craft my timelines and run those timelines. Wow. So yeah, just because she's such a valued team member, I pay her more, but I do think a going rate is about 150. And how long is she there for on actually let's take a step back. First of all, how long do you average on average photograph for on a wedding day and then how much of that time is she there for? Yeah, interesting question as well. So I found when I entered the luxury market that a minimum, a bare minimum of coverage became 8 hours. And I feel like prior to that point, it's, it's usually six is kind of entry level, or at least it used to be when I was back in that price point. Sure. So at least at least eight hours. When I work with a wedding planner, I actually give their clients an additional hour of coverage uh, just as an incentive and as a thank you to those wedding planners for referring me. So most of my wedding days end up being about nine hours. If I have a client who is spending $10,000 somewhere along that price point, I'm usually looking at between 10 and 12 hours of coverage. Okay. And then how, what percentage of that time then you have that third, that, that, that assistant, if you will, there with you for that day? Typically six hours. So usually from the start of the day until dinner time is when I, is when I let her go. Wow. That's incredible. I, I, again, I don't know that I've ever heard of a photographer bringing along kind of a dedicated assistant who's not photographing, who's there to take care of the details. But if you truly are going to add or offer that elevated service to your brand, I think that's a wonderful component. That's, that's really incredible. Okay. So elevated service, you're talking about responsiveness and then having this, this third, if you will, this, this person, this assistant that's coming along, focusing on the details, anything else to add to the elevated service element before we move on to details? I don't think so. I think that my second point, attention to detail, is actually very closely related. So that's also where I plug in offering that third person, you know, and I, I've trained her to to be alert and to think preemptively, to, to think, to notice when the groom is sweating, you know, and, and go grab water without being asked if needed. So just having that level of detail. But I also think the attention to detail comes into play when you're photographing, when just in creating cleaner, cleaner photos as well. I think that sophistication, which is a word that my clients use to describe their style, which is likewise a word that I try to use to describe my work in turn to really appeal to them. I think that sophistication is actually more so about simplicity than it is about being over the top. 
That's fascinating. And do you think that that's the case as you move higher and higher up in, in the income brackets of, of the clients that you're working with? Because it seems like, I, I don't know if this is the case, I think I maybe even heard this commented on before by somebody like Dennis Reggie, um, who's kind of like the godfather of, of wedding photojournalism and who works with the ultra, ultra rich. Um, but it, it seems like maybe those who are going from mid-level income bracket to maybe middle high end to maybe moving into the high end, they kind of want to show off their money. And, and maybe so maybe their weddings would be a little bit more over the top. Whereas those who are, who have had money for a while, who are comfortable in it, they maybe do have those sophisticated tendencies, like you said, that might also correlate with a, a bit of minimalism. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. That was one of the most fascinating things to me when I shot my first wedding for 10,000 was that the detail, like the stationery was stunning, but it was so simple. It was white. It was letterpress. It didn't have a lot of color on it. Um, Even her dress, it was very, very classic, but it definitely was not over the top. And is there something in particular or maybe certain things that you keep in mind as you're photographing the day when you talk about keeping things clean? What does that look like in your mind as you're composing images? I think cutting out distraction as much as possible. So this truly is just a really good photography tip is choosing really clean backgrounds, Um, really watching out for what's in your background. Is there clutter? Is there trash? You know, things like that. Um, One of my personal favorite techniques is just to choose a really clean wall that's even lit and put put my bride in front of that and just create this beautiful, clean canvas for, for a beautiful portrait. And, and I guess this is a good segue then into the third element that you mentioned of offering this luxurious service, which is curation. So what does that curation process look like for you? I mean, is it, are we just simply talking about the culling process after you get all the prints back after the wedding day, after you've had the film developed, or what does that curation process look like for you? It's definitely what you mentioned. So I definitely think of culling for sure. So cutting out, cutting out extra, I think this is where the idea of less is more really, really shines because I think that you, you can actually create a perception of having an elevated product by simply cutting more and more and more and just showing the very best. And I think that interestingly enough creates a product that looks more high end. Even though you might have a lot of those like okay is shot, you know, as you're pulling through, but the fact that you only deliver the very, very best, I think really goes a long way with this idea. Which is an interesting point in conversation these days as photographers are delivering, you know, upwards of between 1,000 and 1,500 images on a regular basis. And it begs the question, of course, I've heard this from other photographers as well, but like how, how in the world do photographers expect most of these clients to have the time to go through or even want to go through say 1500 images in a gallery and actually even keep those in mind. Why not cull more heavily and offer them that much better finished product? Uh, but then the images yes. maybe are, are more memorable because there are less of them that they had to look through instead of being, you know, the, the, the Facebook experience, if you will, or the Instagram experience where you're just endlessly scrolling. Now you've got a smaller gallery to look through and you can appreciate them that much more. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And and maybe this is a little bit out of order as far as the, the type of question, but I'm really curious. There are plenty of photographers over time that have talked about photographing the high-end bride or, or photographing high-end weddings, but what was your motivation to go that that route? And I know you alluded to this at least briefly earlier when you talked about what you charge and how that, that tied into the costs of shooting film. But was that the biggest motivation or what led you to this particular segment of the market? So it was twofold. It was definitely the film. So knowing that that just was in line with my creative heart really was was that I wanted to shoot that and I needed to elevate my price point for that reason. But then The other part, which is truly even more foundational, was knowing that I want to be a mom. I want to be a mom and I want to have time to be a mom. And so that has always been, always been a part of building my business was, was creating, building it on a model that would give me lots of time, Yes. but then would also produce an income that is valuable to my family. 
And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that word model too, because this is something that I, I've alluded to quite a bit as of late on the Boca podcast, but it's so important to be clear about your personal goals for the sake of developing a business model that supports those business goals, which then can, of course, drive certainly your target client, the prices that you charge, and how you spend your time day to day, which then can lead to the opportunity to be able to create a more efficient business model and to have more freedom and flexibility as a business owner. But I'm I'm glad that you mentioned that word. It's so, so important. I think it's a great example for our listeners. I want to jump back really quickly here as we close to our previous conversation. When you were talking about curating or culling, how many images do you deliver as a final product to most of your wedding clients? Yeah, usually between 800 and 1,000. And I do feel like that's still high. So my my goal is definitely to keep trimming that down for sure. I think it gets really difficult when I have these really long wedding days and yeah. I'm shooting a reception for four or five hours. Um, that just like eats up eats up that time. So that even for me personally is is learning to curate that even more for sure. Yeah, it really is tough. I, I I remember shooting the you know the ten, twelve, fourteen hour days, this type of thing, and and much of that, as you said earlier, was the reception, and then trying to figure out when you should be photographing versus you know when it's just re- repetition, but then staying around long enough so that you can still be there for when they leave. That that's a that's a bit of a challenge, and I think it would be interesting for photographers to to find creative ways to to photograph a reception, but maybe not even have to stay for that that full reception just for the sake of kind of minimizing the the number of images that need to be photographed in the end. But uh, I I think this is a a good point of conversation. Again, let's find ways as photographers to curate more effectively that which we're delivering to the client so that we are delivering that much better a product, final product in the end. I think that's a great recommendation. And ultimately, hopefully that'll save us a little bit of time in the process too. So this is good, Charity. Thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and your knowledge with us. Where can our listeners find you online? Yeah, I'm mostly on Instagram. So at Charity Mauer Photo is my handle. And then in addition to that, you can find me at my website, which is www.charitymauer.com. Mauer is M-A-U-R-E-R. There's an extra R in there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charity, for sharing with the Boca podcast today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Nathan. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Thank you.